Hello everyone, this is Dr. Stevens and this is a lecture for Unit 3 in Literary Genres, a lecture on the language of poetry. Uh, before I get started, a couple of words, or maybe more than a couple. First of all, that picture that accompanies the lecture, that is a picture of Robert Hayden. Um, he is one of our poets for this uh, unit. He wrote the poem that some of you have commented on, uh, Those Winter Sundays. Uh, secondly, in case you don't know it, when you are playing back a Tegrity class, as they call them, these lectures are called Tegrity classes, uh, you can click in the uh, upper right hand corner, not of your computer screen, but of the player, that is the Tegrity player. You can click the maximize uh, button in the upper right hand corner to a, see a larger screen and that might help you um, see the handouts, the documents, and so on that I'm working from. Uh, another uh, word before we get started, um, this lecture covers a lot of material, and uh, I'm going to be going through it fairly quickly in order to cover it um, in what I think of as the allotted time for lectures. I try to keep lectures under 30 minutes. That doesn't always happen, um, but if I'm going to do it in the case of this particular lecture, we're going to have to go fairly quickly. So, if you need additional information, okay, if I am going too fast and there's something that I've covered that I didn't cover adequately, or that you didn't understand the first time around, um, you can go to the NIL, that is the Norton Introduction to Literature, to Chapter 10, and there's a lot of discussion of the language of poetry in Chapter 10. There is also a glossary starting on page A1, that is Appendix 1, at the back of your book, a glossary that covers a lot of these terms. Um, some of them fairly thoroughly, like metaphor, I think it covers fairly thoroughly. And then finally, um, if you're still lost and you need to ask questions, get some clarification, don't hesitate to post your questions on the discussion board. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, the language of poetry, I want to read you something uh, from chapter 10, beginning on page 545, and I believe uh, that uh, this particular passage is, yes, it's on page 545 itself, and it answers the question, why? What is so important about the language of poetry? And what I'm reading here is from the paragraph that begins chapter 10, where your editors read, why is it important? Because poems are often short, and remember we're talking about lyric poems here, and lyric poems are the shortest of the genres that we consider. Because poems are often short, much depends on every word in them. Sometimes, as though they were distilled prose, Poems contain only the essential words. They say just barely enough to communicate in the most basic way using elemental signs, each of which is chosen for exactly the right shade of meaning or feeling or both. And these signs or words may be very rich in their meanings and complex in their effects. In other words, the language of poetry, that is, the words that poets choose, are extremely important. You focus a lot more on all of the meanings of individual words and phrases, as I hope you will see as we go along. So what are we going to do in this lecture? All right, so in this lecture, and again, uh, your reference is NIL Chapter 10. Uh, we're going to be talking about words on the literal level and the denotation of literal words. 
Then we'll be talking about the connotation, including the associations that we have with words. We're going to be talking about two very important aspects of poetic language, irony and paradox. We will look at the use of image, at the use of metaphor, at the use of simile, and at the use of symbol. And when I say we will be looking at the use of these things, what I basically mean is, and again, in interests of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe some examples of each of these. I will not be going into a lot of detail about how we can interpret poetry through the language. What I want you to have is some basic understanding of what these things are, literal meaning, image, metaphor, and so on. And we're going to do that by looking at individual poems. So the literal meaning of words, denotation and connotation. This little poem is one of the uh, poems assigned for Unit 3. It goes back almost... Uh, almost 100 years old now, this poem by Sarah Cleghorn. It's in the Norton Introduction, page 545. Short poem, four lines. The golf links lie so near the mill that almost every day the laboring children can look out and see the men at play. Now, denotation, literal meaning. Very, very important when it comes to poetry to distinguish between what the poet poem literally says and then what the way those words might be used um, as images, as metaphors, figures of speech, and so on. But when I say literal meaning, what I mean is that this poem, Sarah Cleghorn, when she uses that phrase, the golf links, she means literally a golf links. That is a golf course, nine holes, 18 holes, um, whatever, the, whatever the golf course might be, she means a literal golf course. And lies so near the mill? Well, the mill, she means a literal mill. And that the golf links lie near the mill, meaning they are right near it. That's where they exist. That's their location. That is all meant literally. Literal golf links, that is an actual golf course, an actual mill, and an actual location, one near the other. Okay? Now, mill in this case is particularly important. I probably don't have to explain to you what a golf course is. But mill, in this particular context, especially once we get to the laboring children, mill would be a kind of factory, and most of the time uh, a mill, especially one a hundred years ago that employed children, would be a textile mill, meaning a, a mill where fabric, cloth is made, and so on, as opposed to, say, a steel mill. Almost every day, the laboring children, not a metaphor, not a symbol, okay, not a figure of speech, literal children who work in this factory, okay? So that is the denotation. Denotation simply means what the words literally mean. They can look out. Okay, if they're near a window, they can literally look out the window. They can literally see the men playing golf, right? Okay, that's all we're going to do with this particular example. There's an awful lot we could say about this little poem. Um, a good poet can pack an awful lot of meaning into four simple lines. But, okay... That's denotation, okay? So I say that's all I'm going to say about denotation. But what about the connotations, okay? 
because all of the things in this poem, beginning with that golf course, have very, very strong connotations. The game of golf, for example, connotes leisure, and it also connotes the class of people who have enough not, not only enough time to go out and play golf, but they also have the money to pay for country club memberships or to pay Lynx fees in order to, to play golf and so on. Whereas the connotation of laboring children, right, in a factory is so different from the connotation of golf course. Golf course connotes one class of people. Laboring children connotes a different class of people, a class of people who probably live in poverty, probably suffer a lot of abuse, suffer from disease and hardship of all kinds, right? Those are connotations. Those are the things then that we associate That we associate with the literal language. So what do we got? We've got two things here. Literal meaning, the denotation is what the dictionary will tell you a golf course is, or what children are, okay, or what play means. Connotation is the things that are suggested by those words. And then there are specific meanings that are very often sort of conventionally associated, very similar to connotation here, uh, that, that are by convention associated with certain words. And here is Yeats' poem, The Wild Swans at Cool. And I'm really tempted to read this poem because it's a beautiful poem. I love it. Uh, so I'm going to read it to you, even though it's going to take me probably 30 seconds or so. And then we'll talk about what I mean by association. So here goes. The trees are in their autumn beauty. The woodland paths are dry. Under the October twilight, the water mirrors a still sky. Upon the brimming water among the stones are nine and fifty swans. The nineteenth autumn has come upon me since I first made my count. I saw, before I had well finished, all suddenly mount and scatter, wheeling in great broken rings upon their clamorous wings. I have looked upon those brilliant creatures, and now my heart is sore. All's changed since I hearing at twilight the first time on this shore the bell beat of their wings above my head trod with a lighter tread unwearied still lover by lover they paddle in the cold companionable streams or climb the air their hearts have not grown old passion or conquest, wander where they will, attend upon them still. But now they drift on the still water, mysterious, beautiful. Among what rushes will they build? By what lake's edge or pool delight men's eyes when I awake some day to find they have flown away? All right. Certainly a lot we could say about this poem, and I'm not going to try to interpret it for you. Um, but I do want to point out one important conventional association that is at the heart of this poem. Notice that the setting for what the speaker is telling us is obviously near... Um, a body of water, right? A lake, perhaps, okay? And what time of year? It's in the autumn. And the association with autumn, the conventional association, given the right context, obviously, okay? Not always. But one of the important 
conventional associations of autumn is declining age. Okay? The end of the year is coming, right, in autumn. And as I record this lecture, we are coming to the what's called the autumnal equinox, the end of summer and the beginning of the fall season, the beginning of the end of the year, which astronomically speaking ends at the winter solstice. Okay, so autumn is then associated with the end of the year. The end of the year is associated with the end of life. A very important association for understanding this poem, which, okay, I said I wasn't going to interpret it for you, but let me point out, it has as its context the passing of time and the suggestion that the speaker is growing old. Let's move on to irony and paradox. Here's a poem we looked at in the lecture on speaker and situation poem by the uh, African-American poet uh, Gwendolyn Brooks. Okay. We real cool, and we're going to look at irony here. Okay, we real cool. We left school. We lurk late. We strike straight. We sing sin. We thin gin. We jazz June. We die soon. Okay, imagine the boys in the hood, okay? Um, now, Gwendolyn Brooks, when she wrote this poem, they probably didn't have that slang expression, the boys in the hood, all right? But you know what I'm talking about. So imagine the boys in the hood, and they're hanging out um, they're hanging out in the club, maybe, or they're hanging out on the corner, right, in the hood. And this is the way they're talking. And what's the irony here? These guys, they think they're cool, right? Okay. This is the way they live and the way they live, man, it's cool, man, okay? And then we get to the end and they say, but we die soon. Ironic, what is irony, right? What is irony? Irony is a situation or a reference when you're talking to something that's contrary to what you might expect. And the way these guys, these pool players, right, at the Golden Shovel, the way they talk, the way they start talking, sets up the expectation that these guys are all right, okay? Um, so it sex sets up an expectation that their outlook is positive. They're cool, man, right? Okay? Uh, and then we get to the end, and that expectation, that expectation of a positive, outlook on life is completely undermined ironically by this reference we die soon and folks we don't need to um, say much about the tragedy in our culture of the young death of so many african-american men to understand the irony there what about paradox paradox is a verbal expression that is related to irony in that the expression itself sets up something that is contrary to expectation. And we're going to begin by looking at this ex a, an example of paradox in this poem. Again, this is a poem from our reading for Unit 3, uh, Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. This is the first section of uh, a multi-section poem, okay? Um, so I'm just going to, to uh, go through the, the first section. And in this discussion of paradox, I've pointed out the paradoxes with the bolded um, italics, okay? So Shelley writes, O wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, Thou, from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven, like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing, yellow and black and pale and hectic red, pestilence-stricken multitudes, O thou, who charitest to their dark wintry bed the winged seeds, where they lie 
cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave, until thine azure sister of the spring. That's the the spring wind, okay? This is the autumn wind from the west, and this then in the spring the south wind. Um, that's the sister of the west wind. Spring shall blow her clarion o'er the dreaming earth and fill driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air with living hues and odors plain and hill. Okay, all of those lines, folks, are an invocation to the west wind. He's simply saying, okay, west wind, I'm going to talk to you. Now, this is what he's saying. Wild spirit, which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver here, oh here. Now, that's a long sentence, but the basic structure of the sentence is quite simple, folks. He's saying, oh, wild west wind, here. In other words, I'm talking to you, please hear me. Destroyer and preserver. What's the paradox? I'm sure you can see it. How can something be both a destroyer and a preserver at the same time? Okay? That's a paradox. If you destroy, you destroy. But destroying is the, op is the opposite of preservation. So how can you be destructive and preserving at the same time? Well, what you do with the paradox is you try to think of other meanings of the words which will resolve that apparent contradiction. So a paradox is a verbal contradiction, and you're looking for ways in which it might be resolved. How does the west wind destroy and preserve at the same time? It destroys because it breaks things up. It scatters the leaves. It preserves by blowing the winged seeds to places where they can then grow in the spring. Okay? Another poem, this is, uh, this poem by John Donne is famous for its use of paradox. And again, uh, I have uh, bolded and italicized the paradox. This is uh, one of what are called Donne's holy sonnets. They are sonnets holy in that they are religious. They are addressed to God as prayers. And you can find this one. I hope you've noticed here that I've pointed out where you can find these things in the Norton Introduction. 628 for Ode to the West Wind. 571 for Dunn's Batter My Heart. Batter my heart, three-personed God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like an usurped town to another due, labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive, and proves weak or untrue. Yet, dearly, I love you, and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie, or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I accept you, enthrall me, Never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. Okay, um, not all of the paradoxes here might be obvious. Uh, this one should be fairly obvious, that I may get up and stand upright, throw me down. Okay, that's what rise and stand means, that I might get up, stand up, right, and stand on my own two feet, throw me down. That's what or throw me. Okay, throw me down, throw me back on my back, okay? A paradox. How will God's overthrowing him make him rise and stand? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, we're not going to go into the theology here. Some of you will understand the theology. Um, if you have questions about it, ask me on the discussion board. I'd love to tell you, but we need to keep moving. Take me to you, imprison me. Now, you understand in prison, right? Put me in prison. Okay, incarcerate me. The paradox, 
except you enthrall me. Enthrall, you may be familiar with this word. Dunn is using it in an older sense, which means to make a slave of, which would be related to imprisoning, right? Making somebody captive, making somebody a slave. Unless you enslave me, I will not be free. And then this word ravish. It's uh, an old meaning of ravish would be our meaning of rape in the sexual sense. Chaste would mean sexually pure here. I cannot be sexually pure unless you rape me. Okay? So, just quick reference to the theology behind all of these things. Okay? God needs to do things to us which in ordinary mortal terms might seem like they would be abusive, they would be harmful, throwing me down, enthralling me, imprisoning me, raping me, and so on. But the way God's purposes in doing these things are just the opposite of what we might think. They, the, God's actions ravishing, imprisoning, and so on, throwing me down, those actions are actually actions that correct me, that bring me to repentance, all right, and that then make me a more upright person. Let's talk about images. Very important. Very important. Images, we're going to go back to literal meanings of words now, okay? Okay. This is from um, Hard Rock Returns from the Hospital for the Criminally Insane. Some of you have commented on this poem in the, on the discussion board, um, so you know that uh, Hard Rock went to the hospital for the criminally un insane and was given a frontal lobotomy in order to cure his violent behavior. Um, what we're concerned about here are these images. Hard Rock was known to take no shit from nobody, and he had the scars to prove it. Split purple lips, lumped ears, welts above his yellow eyes, and one long scar that cut across his temple and plowed through a thick canopy of kinky hair. Excuse me. <coughs> All right. The things named here are named literally. These are not metaphors. Um, the scars are literal scars, things that marks that Hard Rock had on his body, his face, and so on. Um, his split lips and ears that were lumped where he'd been hit on the ears and so on. His yellow eyes. These are all literal details of his face. And when a poem introduces literal visual details things that are very specific, specific objects that we can see and presents them in a way that allows us to see them clearly, we are dealing with images. So we can see those scars, we can see the purple lips, the yellow eyes, and so on, all right? We can see the hair. Okay, so images. Now, Images have all kinds of associations, and this is usually why a poet uses images. Uses images because of the things that are associated with those images. So you get back to the beginning of our look at poetic language, where we looked at literal meanings of words, and then we looked at the connotations and the associations, right? So if you're looking at somebody who is all scarred up, has split purple lips and lumped ears and welts over his eyes and so on, what do you associate those things with when you see somebody like that? Well, an obvious association here, you don't even need to be told that hard rock is a convict, right? The obvious association is somebody who has experienced violence, somebody who has uh, probably had a violent life, and so on. 
So those associations, images, the literal things you can see, associations, the different things that you associate with those images. That's part of reading imagery in a poem. All right, folks. Well, I've reached my 30-minute limit here, but I've still got to cover metaphor, simile, and symbol. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to bear with me for a few minutes more. Give me a few more minutes past my allotted time. Metaphor. What is a metaphor? Very simply, a metaphor takes one thing and talks about it as if it were something else. Okay? In other words, it treats it as if it were something that it is not. Okay, and that's how you can tell that something is a metaphor. If you know what the metaphor is referring to, and you can say, okay, well, I know, you know, I, ref I know it's referring to a bird. Well, a bird can't be a dolphin. Okay, then you know that we're dealing with metaphor. So this is the beginning of the sonnet on page 60, 690 in the Norton Introduction by Jared Manley Hopkins uh, called the Windhover. Now, a Windhover is a bird. It's a kind of falcon. All right, and that's what the poem is about, at least at the beginning, at least at the beginning. So, excuse me. So he begins, I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dolphin, dappled dawn drawn falcon in his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air. Where's the metaphor? Well, first of all, you need to understand, and you could uh, tell this from the title of the poem, The Wind Hover, because, I mean, if you know birds, then you know that a wind hover is a is a kind of falcon, all right? I caught, first metaphor, I caught this morning. Well, okay, the center fielder catches the fly ball. That's caught in the literal sense, right? But caught is a very, very common metaphor, okay? If I say to you, we're talking about, we're talking about metaphor, and you say to me, and you say, oh, Dr. Stevens, I catch your meaning, right? You don't mean that you literally caught my meaning as if it was something I threw to you and you held out your hands and you caught it in your hands, right? No. No, you mean caught in the metaphorical sense. So you're treating, you're treating the action of understanding something as if it were a, an object that you could literally catch with your hands, right? So that's metaphor. Um, Minion, strange word, but it means something like a darling, okay? Something, a, a precious individual, okay? Like a darling child. So we're talking about this bird as if he were the darling of the speaker. And then what's this? Kingdom of daylight. What's this? Kingdom of daylight. Daylight's not a kingdom, right? Daylight is simply daylight. The sun comes up, the sky is light, you've got daylight. But now we're treating daylight as if it were a kingdom. Okay, very important. That's a metaphor. Okay, this is the kingdom of daylight. Well, daylight isn't normally a kingdom, and you could talk about daylight in, in completely different terms if you wanted to, couldn't you? All right, but we're talking about daylight as if it were a kingdom. That is as if it were a region that is ruled by a king. And then we get this word dolphin. What is a dolphin? All right, a dolphin is an heir to a kingdom. All right, so I mean, in the British um, royal family, the heir to the throne or the heir to the kingdom of England is the Prince of Wales, all right? But in France, well, they don't have kings anymore in France, but in the old days when they had kings, the heir to the kingdom was the Dauphin, all right? 
So we are then treating this falcon, and there are other metaphors in these three little lines, all kinds of metaphors. I don't have time to talk about them all, all right? But you see how we're taking this bird and we are treating the bird metaphorically. We are treating the bird as if it were something else, the heir to a kingdom. Then we take the daylight and we treat the daylight as if it were something else. The daylight is the kingdom itself. Um, we take this idea of understand of well in this particular case catching meaning that um, the speaker caught in the sense of seeing all right so we're talking about the act of seeing as catching something and so on metaphor treating something in terms of something else that it is not how do you know whether it's a metaphor you look at what the language is referring to and you ask yourself, okay, um, it's referring to such and such, but it's referring to such and such in these other words that are not the same thing, so it must be a metaphor. Referring to a bird, but it's referring to a bird as if it were the heir to a kingdom, so heir to a kingdom then must be a metaphor for this bird. Similarly, not quite as complicated usually as a metaphor, but a simile makes an explicit comparison where a metaphor talks about an object as if it were something else. A simile keeps the object and the thing it's being compared with separate. So this particular simile is from Robert Frost's poem, Mending Wall. Um, and this is toward the end of the poem where the speaker says, about his neighbor. He and his neighbor are mending a stone wall. Uh, he and his, he refers to his neighbor. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand like an old stone savage armed. Okay. The word like is keeping, whoops, is, didn't mean to highlight that folks. I'm down here. Okay, the, the word like is keeping the two things separate. The neighbor, okay, who is carrying stones, right? The neighbor is not a Stone Age savage, all right? Um, but he's being compared with the Stone Age savage, the old stone savage uh, armed, okay? So we've got those two things, we're comparing them. The neighbor is like an old stone savage okay armed with rocks the meaning meaning uh you know we imagine people from the stone age who because they didn't have uh, ak-47s and uh, patriot missiles and so on they used stones to attack each other all right so we have the idea that the neighbor reminds the speaker of a savage all right our last topic, last form of language for poetry is the symbol. What is a symbol? A symbol is simply something that comes to stand for something else. There are all kinds of symbols. There are mathematical symbols, right? Mathematical symbols tend to be fixed. All right, if you got a symbol in math, it means one specific thing and one specific thing only. Symbols in poetry are much more flexible. Um, and there can be a wide range of symbolic reference, meaning a symbol can refer to a variety of different things. We're coming full, full circle here. We're going from a literal object to that object being treated as a symbol. So the literal object, if you go back to our beginning where we looked at literal language, is that golf course. All right? And we can treat the mill, we can treat the laboring children, and we can treat the men at play. We can treat them all symbolically. In the interest of time, I am going to restrict myself 
to the men at play. Okay, and I'm going to say that in this poem, the men at play, which are meant in the poem literally, okay, these are men that you can actually see on the golf course. The children can look out and they can see these men playing. But in the context of the poem, the men at play become a symbol for something else. Okay? They become a symbol. And again, this is where you're going to need to rely on connotation and on the things that are associated with men at play in this context. All right? So the men at play then, depending upon the reader, and, and, and again, there's a wide range of possibility here, but I'm going to suggest what for many readers, some of the things that the men at play would symbolize, they would symbolize the, the class of people who own factories and who profit from factories. They symbolize the class of people who exist, we would say, because of the work that other people, namely especially the laboring class, do. They are the people who have the money, the people who have the leisure because of the work of other people. So we will say that there is at work in this poem some class symbolism. The men who are golfers, they're just out there on the golf course, right? Okay, they don't think of themselves as symbols, but in the poem, they take on that symbolic significance, symbolizing something about wealth, symbolizing something about class structure. And we're going to end by going back to another poem that we looked at earlier in the lecture, and that is Yeats's Wild Swans at Cool. And I want to talk about the symbolism of those swans, lover by lover, swans mate for life. Okay, so lover by lover is a reference to each pair of swans, okay, husband and wife, if you want to think of it that way, lover by lover, they. So, unwearied still, lover by lover, they paddle in the cold, companionable streams or climb the air. Their hearts have not grown old. Okay, and that's the line I want to focus on. Okay. Their hearts have not grown old. And then passion or conquest, whether they are victorious over something, whether they are engaged in the passion of relationship of lover by lover and so on, wherever they go, wherever they wander, Passion and conquest will always attend upon them. Okay? They do not grow old. Now, in the context of the poem, which you will remember, I suggested, is a poem about the declining years, about growing old at the end of life, and so on. Okay? In that context, the swans become... Okay, I want to write this here, okay? Swans ah, become a symbol of immortality, eternal life, okay? Now, I do not mean that swans literally live forever. I do not mean to suggest that swans are have eternal life or anything like that, okay? I'm talking about what they symbolize in the context of the poem, all right? And when you think of it that way, when you think of autumn and the references to autumn, the beauty of autumn and so on, when you think of how that suggests the end of the year and then by association the end of life, then you can see how these references and descriptions of the swans in that context 
suggest immortality and eternal life. Now, let me end by saying that when you start finding symbols in poems, you are not finding something that is made explicit. A metaphor is explicit. When Jared Manley Hopkins refers to the falcon as, a, as the heir to a kingdom, that's explicit. He wants you. He's being very deliberate. He wants the reader to think of the falcon in those terms. When I say swans become a symbol of immortality, I don't mean that Yeats explicitly points to them as a symbol. No, I'm saying that this is something that I believe we can argue about the use of swans in this poem. So it's an interpretation. Okay? In my interpretation of this poem, and it's not a complete interpretation, but in my interpretation of this poem, I am saying swans become a symbol of immortality, which allows me then to say that, among other things, this is a poem about mortality and the nature of eternal life. So that's it, folks. 46 minutes. I went 16 minutes over my time. I'm sorry. I hope you managed to last this long, or maybe you put me on pause and went out and had dinner, then came back and finished the lecture, whatever it is. I hope this has helped you understand the language of poetry. So thanks for listening, and I will see you on the discussion board.